Hey guys, guys, welcome. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I already started, but uh, I noticed I hadn't been streaming, so I'm starting now. You'll notice in 1 Corinthians 15, it starts off with the word moreover. So he's dealt with certain issues in chapter 14, particularly the place of tongues and the place of prophecy in the church. And he ends with saying, uh, let everything be done decently and in order. But now he's going to address another issue that had arisen in this church. But he doesn't start addressing it till about verse 12. So he starts off with this, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. And hopefully... Nobody here has believed in vain. I'm going to raise that up just a fraction, guys. And there we have it. Uh, maybe not. That might be a little better. All right. Uh, verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. And here it is. That Christ died for our sins. You see, when I'm speaking to people for the first time, the very first thing that I bring, the first truth that I bring, is the same gospel. Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, just as the scriptures foretold is what that according to the scriptures means. Just as the Old Testament scriptures had foretold, Christ died for our sins. That he was buried. Yes, he was buried in a rich man's tomb, just as the Old Testament foretold, and he died, he, his, his death and his grave was with the wicked also, uh, who two thieves were crucified together with him. He was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to this, just as the scriptures foretold. Now, you might recall on Good Friday, Easter, we celebrate his death. That's, he died for our sins called Good Friday because it's good for us. It was hard. The death of the crucifixion is such a terrible death. But there he was. He, he died for us, for our sins. And Easter Sunday, he rose again. The third day, you see? Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And he was seen by Cephas. Who is Cephas? That's Simon Peter. And then by the twelve. Now, Judas Iscariot had already killed himself. Uh, so the twelfth, then, would have been Matthias, um, who uh, was, the lot fell to him. They rolled the dice, so to speak. Uh, and he was numbered with the eleven. So uh, he appeared to the twelve. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, which basically puts a uh, an end to any idea that this was um, uh, mass hallucination. And he was seen over a course of a number of days, guys, uh, to, to numerous people, not just one at a time. So this is a genuine rising from the dead. Why do people want to do away with the re resurrection of the dead? Why do they want to do away with a God who first created us? Or is it that because most things go according to the laws of physics, that we don't believe in the supernatural? Well, we try not to believe in the supernatural. Because it's seldom that we see the supernatural. But I can, I can tell you this. There are times in almost everybody's life when something happens and they say, whoa, that was, that could well have been God intervening. For me, that's happened a number of times. Um, but for me, of course, uh, praying for people to be healed and seeing them actually healed uh, is a, a semi-regular experience. Um, so the supernatural uh, 
the, these things are grasped by faith. And the faith outworking is it happens in the physical realm, you see. So let's be done with this idea that the physical is all there is. It's clearly not. God has put eternity in the heart of, of, of mankind. We know that there's more. God has put a conscience in every person. And a conscience isn't something that uh, would appear through evolution, guys. This is God speaking to you and I. When we do what is right, our conscience says, yep, you're doing what is right. And if we do what is wrong, our conscience there's that pricking of the conscience. This is God's law on our heart. Anyway, let's carry on. He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain till the present, but some have fallen asleep. That means they've died. After that, he was seen by James, it's the brother of John, and then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as one born out of due time. Now, you remember the Apostle Paul persecuted the church, but Jesus met him when he was on the road to Damascus, to, to um, and Damascus is not in Israel, it's in Syria. And he was on the road to Damascus to, uh, to arrest any Christians that were in that city. He had the permission, had, had letters written by the Jewish leaders, uh, and uh, they, they had an agreement with the Roman governor at the time. The Roman gov governor had the say over the secular affairs. That was Pontius Pilate. Uh, and as far as the um, religious affairs were concerned, that was the Sanhedrin. That was the, the Jewish leaders. And here he had letters from them so he could um, arrest Christians that were in, in Damascus, Jewish Christians, of course. Anyway, let's carry on. Uh, for I am the least of the apostles. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. Who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Yes, he did. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. A bright light shone and a voice came down to, to Paul, whose name was Saul at the time. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And he knew straight away that he had been doing the wrong thing. He thought he was getting rid of a threat to Judaism, but he was trying to do away with the followers of the Messiah. The Messiah had come. That was the Lord Jesus. And he was trying to do away with the followers of the Messiah. He couldn't win. But he became a Christian. At that time, I believe it. Okay, there we are. He says, by, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me, with me, sorry. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach. And so you believed, you Corinthians. Now, now he's addressing the moreover that we find in verse 1. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? You see, these guys who say there's no resurrection of the dead would be following the Sadducees. The Sadducees at that time had control of the the temple of, of the high priesthood, they were Sadducees. They didn't believe in a resurrection. And as someone said, that's why they were sad, you see. Anyway, uh, these guys, somehow, some among them said, there is no resurrection of the dead. What a silly thing to say. Why on earth would we be Christians, would we choose to be Christians, if all we're going to get is hardship from the, from the world, uh, when this life is all there is. And the apostle deals with that a little later. He says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we're found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, 
whom he did not raise up, if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. Jesus had to die and rise again if our sins were to be forgiven. Then also those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Yeah, we're having hardship in this life, and we're not even saved in the next. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits. That's the, the um, first fruits are talking about the very first ripe grapes or the very first ripe fruit on the tree um, that is offered back to God. Um, so Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. So he's the first one who was resurrected. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, Christ also was a man, all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Yes, Christ is already risen. Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming, at his parousia, at his coming. When Jesus returns, the, everybody that belongs to him, those who are Christ's, in other words, will be resurrected. Those who are Christ's. And that's important. That is coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. It's God has put all things under Jesus' feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. In other words, God the Father is not under the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when all things are made subject to him, that's Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him. In other words, Jesus is subject to God the Father. That's the, the order in the, in the Godhead, that God may be all in all. Now, that doesn't mean Jesus is any less God. No, he's not. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When we baptize, we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We baptize into the name of, of God. The, these are all one. It doesn't mean they're the same. God is the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, but they are one. Um, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead, if the dead do not rise at all? And why are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Um, this baptism for the dead is possibly something that they did back in the day when Christians um, were put into prison, well, those believers were put into prison without ever having a chance to be baptized. And so they'd get someone else, perhaps, to stand in for them, baptism by proxy. And then they, they were um, uh, put to death, you see, because um, to be a Christian in certain places or to stand up for Christ had the death sentence. So, or it could be just uh, prisoners... Um, that were were going to die and then they, they couldn't be baptized in prison. Uh, it could be anything like that. It's just uh, these are possibilities. Um, I'm sure there are other possible explanations as well, but it's likely to have been a baptism by proxy. Someone getting baptized for someone else who couldn't be baptized. And then uh, and subsequently that person died. Okay, and why do we stand in jeopardy? That's um, our lives are in danger every hour. I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I 
die daily. I'm in jeopardy daily, you see. If in the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is that to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, or tomorrow we die. Uh, this fought with beasts at Ephesus um, is uh, the idea of the, the gladiators. Well, the gladiators were just one group. But they had Christians put into the so-called circus uh, at Rome, at Ephesus, different places. Um, and then they would loose wild animals uh, to tear them to pieces, you see. They'd make the wild animals hungry. And then they'd have a go at the Christians. Uh, also a terrible thing. Paul himself didn't have to go through that because he was a Roman citizen. It was against Roman law to do that to a Roman citizen. You could put them to death uh, if uh, if it came to that. Um, but the Apostle Paul would have been put to the sword rather than, um, you know, go, go through torture. Anyway, if I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is if the dead do not rise, then we might as well eat and drink. Just, in other words, enjoy ourselves, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits awake to righteousness and do not sin for some do not have the knowledge of god i speak this to your shame he says guys get your act together the dead in christ do rise it's not this this wicked thought of the of the sadducees that there is no resurrection but someone will say how are the dead raised up with what body do they come? Uh, these are people who would scoff, you see. Foolish one, what, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. What you sow, you do not sow that body which shall be, but mere grain, wheat, or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. You see, the grain, you take a look at the seed, the seed itself becomes the uh, the nutrition for the sprout. And then once it's used up the seed, it starts uh, sending down roots and it'll get its nutrition from the soil. But initially that seed dies because it's giving sustenance to whatever's sprouting from it. So we are sown. That's what the Apostle Paul is making the reference to. We're sown just as seed. But when we, we are raised, we are raised um, with a body that's different. It'll still be a human-looking body, make no mistake, but it'll be able to, uh, th there'll be no corruption there. Let's read on. God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. He's talking about the plant now. Seed becomes the, 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 uh, the nutrition for the plant. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another of flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, that's uh, the stars, and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another of the moon, another of the stars. One star differs from another star in glory. So, all vastly different from one another. God is not a God of monotony, guys. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. In other words, we decay. The body decays. It is raised in incorruption. The new body God gives us will no, never decay. It lives forever. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory like unto christ's glorious body it is sown in weakness yes we especially as we grow older we we recognize that there's certain things we can't do now that we used to do with ease before it is raised in power it is sown in natural body it is raised a spiritual body it still is a body guys don't imagine that we're some some uh, um some ghost floating around on a cloud uh, playing a harp. That is just a parody of what God has in store for us. 
it would blow our minds to see what God has prepared for those who love him. Anyway, raise a spiritual body. It's still a body. Uh, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's the Lord Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual was not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Amen. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. That's what we are like right now. And as is the heavenly man, the Lord Jesus, so also are those who are heavenly. All those who have gone before, all those who will be resurrected, that's us. Or changed in an instant, as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, we will become like the heavenly man, like the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, in other words, we are Adam's offspring, so we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. We are Christ's offspring, Christ's offspring by adoption. So, on we go. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, that's the natural, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption, something that decays, inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. And here's something that he's got from God Almighty. We shall not all sleep. No, we won't all die is what he's talking about. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. That means with bodies that don't grow old and, uh, and decay. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible, this, this body that can decay, must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. Can you see that? You are going to be an immortal being. You're going to be someone who will never, ever die again if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. If you put your trust in him and uh, you are his disciple. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then, then and only then, shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. Death is swallowed up in victory. And this is all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done. And we'll go back to that uh, that gospel that we were looking at from verse 3 on. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, O oh, hell or grave, where is your victory? Well, he says the sting of death is sin. It is. Sin separates between us and our God. And the strength of sin is the law. And we're all lawbreakers. So we're all liable before a holy God. But, and amen to the Lord for this, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How can he have the victory? When we've broken the law and sin is separated, Jesus paid the penalty. The wages for sin is death. But Christ died for our sins. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen to that. We're not of all men most miserable because we know we will be raised at the last day. There is a resurrection coming. Hallelujah. Let's go back to what he says from verse 3 right through to here. And let's unpack that a little bit. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. 
and I, I, as I say, I do the same. Whenever I'm, I'm sharing my faith, I start with the gospel. That Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures foretold. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day, just as the scriptures foretold. And why was it necessary for Jesus to die for our sins? Why was that necessary? Because we are all sinners and sin separates between us and God. And if nothing is done about that, then at death, what happens at death is, is horrific. The separation remains and everything good that was a part of us or, or, or a part of this world is taken back to God. Uh, but everything, everything evil and wicked in us, we retain because it, we have to be removed from God's presence. God looked at that situation and because he, we had been created in his image and he had his love is toward us, he made a way for our sin to be forgiven. You see, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's all except the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages that we earn through our sin is death. And that's not physical death he's talking about. That's the second death. Second death is the lake of fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Not for It wasn't prepared for humanity at all. It's not God's desire that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Not everybody will repent, mind you. Anyway, where were we? Um, so the wages for sin is death, and that's why Jesus came. And here it is. Christ died for our sins. So Jesus paid the wages, but death couldn't hold him. You see, if we died for our own sins, death would hold us for eternity because our sins couldn't be forgiven. But because Christ died, buried, death couldn't hold him because he'd never sinned. He overcame death and he was raised the third day still having paid for all of our sins. The eternal, the infinite, dying for the finite. So the grace he generates through his death is more than enough for all of humanity. More than enough. He was buried and he rose again the third day, just as the scriptures foretold. And guys, that's what baptism is about. When you get baptized, you go under the water. That's figurative of you dying with Christ. That means the old Mark or the, the old Finley or the old Corey or the old whoever you may be has died, gone under the water, has died, been buried. And when you come up out of the waters of baptism, that's symbolic of rising in newness of life in Christ. Uh, the Bible tells us this. God took the sinless one, the Lord Jesus Christ, made him to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God in him. So when you are raised, uh, um, when you come up out of the waters of baptism, you are raised in Christ. You made the righteousness of God in him. God looks at you and he sees Jesus, you see. He sees the righteousness Jesus has. You're clothed with Jesus' righteousness. Now, there's a process that we become more like Jesus it's called sanctification. Every Christian should be becoming sanctified. Uh, in other words, becoming more like our Savior Jesus. That, that, that's a process. But the moment you are saved, and don't wait to get better first before you decide to follow Christ. Step out, say, I'm going to follow Christ. Holy Spirit comes into your life to, to help you to be that person you can be. Because uh, in and of yourself, your own righteousness, the Bible says, is like filthy rags. You need to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ, which is a perfect righteousness. The righteousness of God in him. Well, that's it, guys, for today. 
thank you for joining me and i will catch you again i hope tomorrow but we'll see how we go